You're listening to the Straight to Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's going on and welcome to what is the first of what will be for the immediate future at least regular Friday one a week episodes of the Straight to Video Podcast as opposed to the regular two episodes a week which I've been doing since the show started. I put this up online earlier this week just to fill people in as we get close to 200 episodes. I want to look at tweaking a few things, giving the show a bit of a revamp. But also behind the scenes, there's a lot of stuff coming up with some live shows finally after what seems like forever. And also the brand new straight to video project, which was announced earlier this week on the STV Patreon, giving details about the awesome new straight to video 80s video shop, which is opening soon. Yep, that's right. An actual video store in 2022. Not really the kind of thing you go to the bank manager about as a business plan. But that's what's happening with myself and good friend Chris Annabel of Glue Pro Goalkeeping Gloves. So watch this space for more info real soon. Or you can check out at 80s Video Shop on Twitter and Instagram for all the latest news. Anyway, on to today's show, and this was a mega one for me. As most of you know, I love to have people involved in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise on the show, and today is one of those. With this podcast, I send out so many interview requests to different people. Some land, some don't, and more often than not, I never hear back, but that's how it is. Sometimes, though, it just takes a long time back and forth to set something up. So today's guest, actress, model and writer, producer, director Jennifer Rubin, I initially reached out to probably well over a year ago. I got all excited when she said she was interested, but it's taken until now to nail it down. But it was really worth the wait. Jennifer is perhaps most well known for her role as Tarion White in 1987's A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors, probably the movie where Freddy Krueger really hit his mark worldwide and it set the blueprint for the next few films. Jennifer's character was a real badass in the movie with the classic line, in my dreams I'm beautiful and bad, and in real life she's as much of a badass with a really interesting, amazing story. From becoming a worldwide sensation as a model in magazines and on billboards, to a movie career battling Freddy Krueger, followed by more psychological dream scares in Bad Dreams, to working with Alicia Silverstone in The Crush, Robocop's Peter Weller in Screamers, and she also appeared in Oliver Stone's The Doors with Val Kilmer. She is still very much part of the industry writing screenplays, but she will be over here in the UK this October at the For the Love of Horror convention in Manchester, along with pretty much all her Dream Warrior friends and casts. Tickets for the event can be found at ForTheLoveOfHorrorUK.com. And on the subject of dreams, if you need to pull a late night shift and need to stay awake, then our friends Dead Skull Coffee have the answer with their awesome ground and full bean rock and roll coffee. If you order from their website, deadskullcoffee.co.uk and add the discount code STV on checkout, then you will receive 15% off your order as a thank you for just being a listener to this show. Okay, let's dive in. Jennifer shares so much in our chat. A lot of personal stuff, the ups and downs of the film industry, how she found life in Hollywood in the late 80s, which I really love to hear about. And I want to thank her for such honesty, but also for being super fun at the same time, making this one of my favorite chats on the podcast. We bounce around a lot, but it's a great talk. So I hope you enjoy listening as much as I did chatting on my straight to video talk with Jennifer Rubin. All right, how you doing? I'm good, Jennifer. Thanks ever so much for doing this for us. So glad we got to set this up. I think we initially corresponded on Facebook probably well over a year ago. So I'm sorry if I've pestered you to lock it down, but I appreciate you taking the time. Well, if you don't, I live under a rock. So I really is like, I just saw your email for like confirming today. And I was like, oh, you know, people think people are on their phones all the time. You know, I didn't want to hurt your feelings or anything. So I was like, oh, you know, I'm a failure. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. You're originally from Arizona. I've only been lucky enough to visit there one time to Tucson and Phoenix with the band I played in some years ago. But I loved it there. And mainly for the people, everyone seems really nice. Did you grow up there, spend your whole childhood there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Arizona is the most beautiful, like five in the morning, five in the p.m. when the sun's setting and all that dirt's in the air. And it's the YouTube blood red sky that he sings about, you know, one of the most beautiful places in the world. 
Wow. So you grew up there through high school and everything. Yeah, I'm a Cal girl. I, they were like riveting up our schools as the urban sprawl was going on and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I love Arizona. Do you go back then? Which have you still got family there? I do have family there, but I don't go back just because the California weather is every day is the same. And I'm such a pussy that I just kind of like don't want to deal with weather, you know? If I go somewhere else, a different climate, I'm going to get a cold. Or... Yeah. You're screwed when you come to the UK later this year then. I know. It's wet. It rains. It's cold. But the breakfast there makes up for it. You got good food, though. We do all right. Was you ambitious as a young girl? Could you see yourself going into any particular industry, whether it be film or modeling? Or did you have any other interests? Because you were, I think you're a competitive swimmer. I was a competitive swimmer but I just started talking about this because uh, my boyfriend Jimmy Wilsey from Chris Isaac's band his biography just came out about him passing away and stuff and I do do a lot of movies that are about drugs or creepy guys following me around <laughs> or something like this, you know, and drugs and and stuff like this. But I was born with something that kind of makes me just self-reverential. Like I'm not looking at what somebody else is thinking about me. I just check in with myself. So that's kind of like not autism, but it's kind of like it makes it difficult for like uh, communication and stuff. So like I didn't have any aspirations. All I wanted was like I said, I want an apartment with my grandma. And then um, somebody goes real snide. That comes with the package. You got to do that anyway. And I was like, well, that is my ambition just to go get an apartment, you know, and then I looked the way I look. I broke my nose playing racquetball. I had a big, big nose and like an Indian chief, just like I wanted, you know, in the Cowboys and Indians, right? So I finished my swing, my racquetball on my nose. And then my mom just said, you have to get that fixed. They fixed my nose. And then 10 seconds later, I became like a model in the movies and it just kept going. And I was like, I have an apartment. How old was you when you had that accident? I was still, I was in high school. Maybe it was like my senior year, junior, senior year. And then I went to college, which I was going to fail out within weeks, like no issues. What was you studying? Well, I was going to do a landscape architecture because I like to be outside, right? Look at a plant. You know, it's that Steven Spielberg kind of environment. So like when you're laying on a launch chair, sunning in the pool, you know, a dragonfly, a lizard, a snake, a hornet, a bumblebee, like, rah, 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 you know what I mean? So you just, I could watch paint dry. I could. Yeah, I could just be like, wow. And I could be into it. I love that. <sighs> it's, well... It's more enjoyable now that I can like say it out loud because like I think I was so afraid when I was acting to admit to it. So I let people think I was stoned or drunk or trouble or wild or this or that. And it's just like, I just got to get back into my apartment, just go do the job, you know, and you have to have a job. I don't organically want a job. Do you? Not really. I just want to do stuff I enjoy. (laughs) Yeah, I want to love what I do, like maybe just this, you know? So you was going to flunk out of architecture. Oh, yeah. And then there was a model scout at college and I was outside of my class. I have to tell you, they gave me 500 classes, like the number 500, because I got into the upper echelon of like really philosophical, crazy college classes. And they had microphones in the ceiling and stuff. And that's when I kind of wanted to quit college because I was like, they're recording everything. They're listening to me all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but there was a modeling agent. They said, model in your hometown and we'll take you to New York. And then I went to the modeling agency Plaza 3 and they said, well, we're going to New York, you know, in three weeks, we'll take you. And then I won International Model of the Year. It became Face of the 80s and da, 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 da. And Brooke Shields was the look. And, you know, I just went in the flow down there. How did your family feel about that? You suddenly being plucked from university. Okay, Jennifer's off to New York. (laughs) Well, I was thinking about this the other day because I remember when I started school, it was like in a lab and there was this Asian doctor with a white coat. And, you know, me and my mom go in the room. And they sit me on the bench. So I'm sitting there and then I immediately like look at my shoes. And I remember my shoes and my knee socks. Like, I don't know, you know, I'm just sitting there like mashed potatoes. So he walks over to the light switch 
<laughs> and he goes, when I switch the light on, you open your eyes. And then when I turn it off, you close your eyes, open your eyes, close your eyes, open your eyes, close your eyes. Right. And then we finish the session. And then my mom goes, can you make her shut her mouth too? <laughs> so I must have been like that person, like not blinking uh, uh, and stuff like that. So, you know, I was kind of like in that trailer in the back and the, sent to my room. So when it happened, I think they couldn't believe it. They were just hoping somebody was going to marry me and I'd be not their problem anymore. And here it went to the moon. Did they see a different side of you then once the modeling happened? Well, not afterwards, because everybody like the women in my family, they're so they were so superior. But they didn't understand that I was just like a boy in a bubble. Somebody who was stuck in a bubble, like, I can hear you, but you're kind of like an object or you're like, just where can we stick her? Did that give you your chance to shine then, do you think, being out there? Well, no, not really, because I think when I was acting, when I was younger, I was always afraid to make a mistake. And so when I was shooting Bad Dreams and stuff, it's a difficult movie for a lot of reasons, because when they were doing the like, I guess, cult leader pedophilia kind of thing. I never connected it with my father. You know, if I was supposed to bring that, because they don't know, I'm not telling them, oh, by the way, my Chinese doctor had me like blinking with the light switch. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm just getting this job. I'm so like glad to be here. And that's my, you know, <laughs> I'm not like Robert England, man. And I see Heather, man, they did this great interview. Like I'm sitting at one of those tables with them and they, man, they like rocking the professional and they can stay on topic and they're just like what and they know they can relate to what the fans want they're just hitting those marks every time just like flicking a switch yeah and then robert will throw me a bone you know like a great thing that he remembers working with me and it'll go right over my head and the thing is is i'm so conscious of it and i'm like oh i wish i could just respond but i just you know that's you, though. That's you. Like, Robert Englund's like this just larger-than-life personality who thrives with that spotlight. He's a star. And he's, yeah, and he's so, ver I mean, I remember meeting him when he was doing V. Wow. You know how managers walk you around, they're like show ponies around Beverly Hills and stuff. I was being walked around because I was modeling in L.A. And we bumped into Robert and his manager, and we walk around, oh, he's going to be a star. And I hadn't met him for Nightmare yet. It'll be like three years prior to that or four, right? Did you remind him of that when you got on the Dream Warriors set? We met years ago. Oh, God. No. He reminds me of days I was like, I don't know. I just remember everything I kind of did wrong because I you just want to. I'm not the greatest actress. I just because I always want to do it right. And I think now that I'm older and I'm writing my own material, you know, I just did a table read and they're like, wow, we haven't seen you act in 20 years. That's not true. I did act and I was just submitted for a best supporting actress role. I had no makeup on and I thought, please don't be the vehicle that goes into this stratosphere. <laughs> please let me have some makeup on. That's it. Though. You never know what opportunities are going to come or what people are going to see at different times. I think when you hit a certain age, though, you forget about all those pressures and stuff. Right. I mean, see, that's what's happened to me. Like I am now the face with the nose that I used to have. See, when they cut my nose off, I became something that they bossed around and said, you're this, you're not even funny, you're pretty. So you're going to be in this line. But now it's kind of like, I have the pleasure of both worlds, because it's not like I'm 60, and I'm invisible. No, it's like, I have my old childhood face back. And now I can be smart and funny again. And who care? I don't care. I mean, I'm self referential. I think that's the right word. I refer to myself about myself. I'm not necessarily hard on myself. Not at all, but I can kind of see because that boy in the bubble thing made me kind of like I'm in two places at one time. That's one of the positives of getting older, just the history you've got in your head. Yeah, it's great because I played a long game, you know, I played a long game. And so I kind of find that I have a lot of energy and I have a lot of this and that a lot of people are like spent. You know what I mean? It's like, come on, team. And I got a team. It is like, oh. Come on, a little more. <laughs> <laughs> when you got into the modeling, it was named International Model of the Year in 84, I believe. Was everything like 
incredibly fast moving view from that initial being spotted from uni and on magazines billboards well the thing is is the first job was 50 pages of italian harper's bazaar 50 pages so i could actually go home and i was a success you know what i mean but the thing is is that um i kind of feel like i was uh abandoned i felt like thrown to the wolves i felt like here you take her. Do you think that happens a lot, though, in that kind of industry, whether it be modeling or film? Because everything is just so under the spotlight, so fast moving. It's like, chuck you on this train and away it goes. We'll see you when you come back. You know, but when you see Bruno Mars, you see Bruno Mars at five years old. Being interviewed by Polly Shaw. Yeah, but you see him dancing yeah. at five. You see those videos and you see those really organic where the parent is in line and just there to be a, like a stage mom. Now, when I look at what I went through and how I did it without family, successfully with having my soul intact, right? Because yeah. people really burn out and kill themselves and plenty of stuff could have killed myself over and I didn't. So that like when I look back, I'm like, wow, I'm alive. I mean, I really did do it but without any family support and only the people I met along the way. So I kind of had like one significant person who put me under their wing to another one, like it's a whack-a-mole bridge, because that only lasts so long because once they know you want something, and this is where that you know thing that touches me is that if you want something, then they start to manipulate you. How bad do you want it? We're hoping you want to bet your whole soul on it. Did you pick up on that from people? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of like the only actress who did like four movies in comedy, four in horror, four in like drama, four in detective, four in out of space, you know, sci-fi. The reason you do that is because you shoot up to the sky. Then like the people who have the money on you, like you say you're a racehorse, when they see the potential of the horse, then they want that horse to do something against their nature. So when you get really there, I had to jump to another genre who didn't know me. And then it was like, oh, she's here and you can do four. And then they're like, well, we'll make you a star. So you should want this. And then if you jump to another genre, then you kind of stay ahead of them trying to get your soul, you know. And you're just trying to pay your rent. When did acting come onto your radar then? Was it something that always appealed to you and you just needed that right opportunity? Or did someone suggest that, hey, you, you'd look good on screen. Here's a phone number for this person who can help you. How was it? I was always worried about my um, rent. Okay. It's <laughs> so, <as> that. <laughs> it's simple. I mean, it's just, I know like, some people had a dream. It's like, no, <laughs> I'm just like roof over my head. So as soon as you get there modeling, and I was a baby, right? They're like, you're old. Your career is almost over. It's like, God damn it, I just got here. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it was like, oh. So you start to learn this. And the way the kind of the older men that are the business people of the beauties in the beauty world, I think they're always kind of trying to tell you, you know, you're a little this and you're a little that and the stuff like this. But, you know, it's almost like, Somebody said that in my ear, I calculate and I say, what could I do next then? And the thing is, is I hadn't really stuck my toe in modeling, even though I got in Vogue and I got in Harbor's Bazaar and I had billboards in Japan and traveled the world. I didn't really stick my toe in and I popped out and went to Los Angeles modeling and became the Cherokee girl out here. And then I knew that I should try to go to Hollywood. I should go do a movie because to me, a movie was more job security. But I was wrong because the thing is, is like, I also thought, wow, if you wrote a book, you would get a million dollars. To me, it was like to write a book, that's a million dollars. And I could never write a book. Now I realize everybody has a book. Like, so the, my proportions are kind of, Mowgli and Jungle Book, like my proportions are of what's important. But I really wish I would have stayed because I like modeling people better. Uh, actors. Ugh. Once you got into the acting, did you see like a total different way of 
how the two different industries operated. Like these people are totally different from the people I was dealing with. Like managers in acting are different from managers in modeling and all that kind of thing. Like totally different. So from Arizona, sunshine, you know, like I knew the light, right? I could find the light all the time. Light, light, light. And I was such a sensation, you know, I was on the billboard. Everything was going great. So then I meet one of these actors from the actor's studio who's like moody, uh, you know, James Dean, the whole nine yards. And I don't know, we're talking about acting. And he says something like, don't worry about where the camera is. You know, it's about the feeling. And I slowly started to lose the light because they give you all these suggestions. Like I could do a perfect basketball layout, but I go out on the court, I get game, I do it one day, okay, fine, she can play, she can shoot, do, do, do. I go out day two, I have two or three people going to come and fix my hand, fix my elbow, do something with my walk, and then I can't shoot shit. That's the most amazing way of looking at it. That's great. Yeah, so it just slowly became like, oh my God, you guys are crazy. But I do get it now. Like now I understand what went into, after writing a script, I understand yeah. scripts. I didn't understand scripts. Now I know and... Now it's so difficult to make a movie. And yeah. Again, hindsight. You got to grow. Got to get that bit older and like, oh, now I realize. Now I realize. But how hard was it to find your feet with like agents and getting auditions in Hollywood? It took me three years because I think that the men there, they want to marry you and they don't want you to be an actress. So I didn't have any support as far as a man goes. I wouldn't even, even the best friend man I ever knew wouldn't give me money to buy it. $2,000 car. I mean, I just was thrown to the wolves, man. I was just in those wolf soup. You know what I mean? Like, and they're friends. You're my friend. But it's kind of like, what the hell's going on here? But I'm not honest. You see, the thing is, I'm self-referential and I'm not telling anybody that. So they think I'm playing by their rules. And so it gets to be like, I'm not being like guile or strategic or anything. I mean, I'm strategic in the fact where I take that information they're giving me, like your career's almost over at 20. Well, then I need to do something else. I don't have a conversation like, oh, sir, maybe you could help me do something. No. You didn't have anyone you could confide in or anything like that. You were making all these decisions. You were like, say, logging the information and yeah. making those decisions yourself. That must have been crazy tough then. I mean, they say like Hollywood eats you up anyway. Well, it was a blast because, you know, we came in like a big school of fish. Adam Horowitz, Keanu, Don Harvey, everybody was there. I was going to ask about that because, I mean, I say you mentioned Keanu, you went with Billy Worth. River Phoenix, saw them two on their motorcycle together. You were like the late 80s Brat Pack. Yeah. Well, <laughs> they were there. They were, the, yeah, they, they were all there. And Lou Diamond Phillips, such great fun movies. And it was exciting then. And then it was all that changing from real film. I come from like black and white into film. And then film was changing from film into VHS beta, people starting to shoot with video, many more films, you know, the whole independent market. And also that drying up and becoming something else. And now it's something else into streaming. You know what I mean? Like when you stick your toe in the river, it's just your timing is on or you're not out of rhythm with this huge industry, right? Yeah. Jump on while you can. That's going to be your track for this time period. So either get yeah. into it or you're not going to be part of it. But I mean, you had a role in the film Blueberry Hill. Oh, that was my favorite. What made that experience so special? Well, that was because it was the first time. So I was a model and they're just sending me into these kind of bank buildings to audition for something on the fourth floor. And he liked me so much, he told me in the room. And I kind of wanted to get down the elevator and it was on Sunset Boulevard. You know, I was walking towards the Roxy and the Whiskey because it was at the corner of Beverly Hills there. And every step was like I was on the moon. Like, are they going to take it back or is it really real or I'm going to get out of here before they say they changed their mind or something? Strath Hamilton and Marcy are a married couple who did just did, you know, they like to make films, you know, things I see people do today, but they were the first people doing it back then. And 
Wow. And they still have their production company. But yeah, Strath and Marcy Hamilton. That's sweet that that was your first kind of introduction. Yeah, with good people. Yeah, really good people. And that was backed up with the role which you're perhaps most well known for, Taryn in A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Yeah. Do you remember how you heard about that role initially? Was that through an agent? That was great. That was still fun. That was just right at the beginning. It was real fun. You know, they send you over... Kind of now I have my stride, right? I know how to go to meetings. I can do four in a day. And Annette Benson, the sweetest, kindest, you know, woman in the world. And then like Chuck liked me, you know, like the director. And then they had us, you know, we had to walk down the hallways. And it was the first time they were reading a cast together to see how they did. That was the first time. Not like Roseanne Ar- Arquette in the lobby, you know, in the waiting room with me or something. It was just only the cast. And like, oh, like, let's try to be good to each other. I remember the hallway and going, oh, my God, are we really doing this? And they put us in that therapy room, had us all sit on the floor, had us all read. And I remember Chuck said, <laughs> because I had to be real upset and, you know, drug oriented and stuff. And so Chuck said to me, not so much. <laughs> Rain it in, Jennifer. Rain it in. (laughs) Keep it pace with the other kids. You know what I mean? But that was like, you know, where I, but it was a direction that kept me in the character, right? You know, but that was the also too that energy because the thing is, is like once I put on that leather outfit, my hair was down like this. And because I model, I was like, this hair does not go with this outfit, but we're finding it in the moment. Like, ah, what am I going to do? And when I walked past the dolly, there was a magazine open and I saw the mohawk and I just grabbed it and I was going to go there because I was just going to complain about my hair. But I was like, can I do this hair? And he's like, yeah, sure. And it was that easy. You know, so the thing is, is like he really was. He was like not personal with me. Like everything was pure. You know, everything was about the character, a real coddling, like a real, you know what I mean? Like if I look at Bad Dreams, which I really want to get behind at some point. But the thing is, is they didn't even tell me what the story was. And it was so psychological. Bad Dreams is perhaps something you'd like to get more into both the character and just learn more about it. But was it more of a production line kind of film, do you think? Oh, it was. It was one of those sets. It was uh, like shot in a hospital. And I hate hospitals a lot. But the people were really perfect, you know, but it was like very clinical. You've said one of your favorite memories of Elm Street 3, which I think is really cool, was just driving to the set each day with such a positive feeling. Could you go into that a little more? I've asked some people in the past about like that time in the 80s when everything seemed great, not just a rose tinted glasses feeling, but there did seem to be a lot of positivity back then. Oh, yeah. You know, it's in that neighborhood that Johnny Depp still lives in that they talked about so much in the trial, right? So Sweetser and Fairfax and Melrose. So all these actors, everybody, Jason, Jennifer Lee lived around the corner, Eric Stoltz, Keanu. So we're all down there. Adam Store, Laura Sangiacomo, Cameron Dye from Valley Girl. Just wave it to people as you go past. <laughs> and there's a billboard of me above Fat Burger with some guy carrying me, you know. And, you know, I have a scarf around my neck and I have a Jeep. So I got a camel colored Jeep. And my boyfriend at the time freaked out about me having a car. Right. And I got this Jeep and I was gone. (laughs) Your biggest fear is going to come to life. So I took off. I got an apartment down there off of Melrose on Huntley and crazy things, man. Guys coming through the windows, Keanu pulling up on his motorcycle Elias coming in and trying to hug me like she's mine and Adam Horowitz picking me up in a Bentley. I mean, it was rocking like Jack Nicholson, you know, at the party, like I went to Helena's and Jack had a club there. I was in and it was all rocking and stuff. I am not at the table. I'm walking. It's probably too loud for me. And I was walking by the bathrooms and then Jack is there and he's staggering. And so I'm like, Jack, I have not been drinking. Do you need a ride home? (laughs) <laughs> which now seems like really a crazy thing to say. He goes, he was fine. He thought that was really nice, but I didn't realize it was his club. And this is the club that Drew Barrymore was at. It was a year later when I was at Jack's club where Drew Barrymore had seen me. I was leaving. I think she was going in and she goes, I love you. Cause it was from Taryn, you know, and then I was sitting down and then the whole table of like 12, Jack comes up, he goes, Jen, 
I got a ride home or something like this. And the whole 12 heads just turned and looked at me. And I was like, I don't know what I said, but it was all right. Oh, I love that. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. And just the wind in your hair and bananas, man, bananas. And the doors, the doors was then too. And oh, my God, that was Nick Cage and the Arquettes and the, it just doesn't stop. It was great. And you got to wait with David Lynch in the Calvin Klein Obsession commercial. Oh, yeah, because they offered me a role in uh, Twin Peaks. But the thing is, is I was with Jack Nicholson, agent at the time. So there was like this agent, Sandy Bresler, who has Jack Nicholson and five other people. And it's me and Dennis Quaid. And I don't know who else. So when the offer came in, he said, uh, Jack doesn't do TV. So we don't do TV. Oh, no. Was Twin Peaks something you'd like to do? Did you enjoy the series? Did you watch it? Well, as far as the audition goes, and Joanna Ray says, you know, David wants you, you know, so come in and meet David. And David had, like, see your room there? He had frogs on sticks, freeze-dried frogs on sticks. I expect nothing less. (laughs) And I was kind of like, I'm from the desert. I know, you know, I'm more like, Spielberg pterodactyl kind of you know prehistoric I was like this one frog scared me to death when I was a kid and so it was a big bullfrog and I was trying to sneak back into my window I scared a bullfrog and so it jumped into my leg and man whew, I got caught that night but I can't say that I well I felt so bad that we passed we also passed on um Oh, what's that other great movie? Drugstore Cowboy. Yeah, they were like, oh, you can't do these drug movies. I was like, that's all I fucking do is, you know, that is my specialty, pedophilia and drugs. You know what I mean? <laughs> is that on your resume? Yeah. Oh, my God. And, and the fact is, is like I just wrote a role for to be drunk. You know, I'm a drunk. So what? You know, and I want to do a real Betty Davis, right? And I was thinking, God, I don't think I would want to get up on the screen and not be wasted like a Hunter Thompson, but as a woman, you know what I mean? Like, ah, God. Was there much opportunity to get a grasp on the success of Dream Warriors or was you like right into the next projects? Right into the next project. Wasn't, what was that? Bad Dreams was next, right? Pretty much straight after, yeah, because you worked on that with Dean Cameron. I'm a fan of everything he does. Yeah, I, I am too. You know, but they pulled stunts when we were filming that I just didn't appreciate because everything was so difficult because, you know, they said a big thing like Dean and I were fighting. And I was just like, can't I get from my fucking front door to the set without God knows what happening? You know what I mean? I talked to him. I was like, why? You got that was so mean, you know, because the thing is, is on that set, like, you know what? Now I don't know what's going on. I still don't. So when I'm sitting at the table with a crew member, that's not a production, you know, the hierarchy. I'm a fucking difficult person. So I don't want to sit outside and eat with them anymore because I've gotten wind. I'm difficult. And I go into my trailer and like, she's anorexic. That's why she's in her trailer. And I'm like, you can't imagine that you're just being so fucking mean to me. Then, you know, Dean and I are somehow competitive, which I don't even understand. I'm not competing against anybody. I mean, I couldn't if I wanted to. And then later I talked to him like, what the fuck was that about? He goes, oh, we're just, we're creating jazz. Like we're buzz. I was like, at whose expense? You know, and then he gave me his little metallic card. It's a credit card that has your bill of rights on it. He goes, use this when you go through the airport because it sets all the alarms off. So when they frisk you and they take out your wallet, you know, pull out this bill of rights card. And somehow that's a F you to the man. And I'm like, you know what, Dean? I got enough problems. I just can't instigate things. Such a contrast to your first two films then. just Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. It's like the basketball court. Come on the scene. I'm shooting it. It's going in. And then you start fucking with the magic and it's over. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I love your role in The Crush, though, with Alicia Silverstone. Me too. I think your part in that is great. Thank you. I think you sort of play the role of the person who is kind of thinking just like what everyone else who's watching the movie. Yeah. You're spotting all these things. And that's what your characters kind of do. Oh. It's like That's cool. You know, I felt neglected there, too, because they were like, could you just wear your own clothes and show up and be yourself? (laughs) You know, and I was like that I can do. I can do that. (laughs) You know what I mean? 
So it's nice to really kind of see your opinion of that role, because that's exactly how I felt like an observer. Yeah, you're saying and seeing what yeah. we're seeing as we watch that film. And when I played the photographer, I know that photography, whatever you capture on film, creates a kind of an intellectual thing. It, it objects it so you can think about it. Like when you film it, it's something else. Yeah. When did you start to work on yet another transition in your career, like doing screenplays? How did that all begin? Oh, okay. So I turned 40. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 40 is a good age. The death nail of Hollywood. Well, I enjoyed 30, but 40, I think you just kind of hit this plane of don't give a fuck. <laughs> No, no. Well, not in film, not as a female in film, because the thing is, your face is no longer an ingenue and it's no longer old enough to be old. So it's really not offensive. I think that I would tell a lot of women don't get surgery around 40 because your face will go through some weird, you know, like from a child to a woman. It's a weird thing to photograph. The skin doesn't hold the makeup the way that it should. But then once it kind of like now my face looks so much better than at 40. So if you can just kind of wait for it to go into its natural. Now I could play a grandmother or a, a woman without children. <laughs> you know? So at 40, I went to New York City to get a job because I never had one of those yet. What was your first day job, Jennifer? <laughs> oh my God, this it was so funny. It was in Soho. It was like the Rocky Mountain rib joint. It was a two-story rib joint. And um, I asked for an application. I was so scared. Then it got to the point where it said experience. And I was like, oh, and I was like, permanent records. I played a waitress. So I was like, I played a waitress. Can I put that down? And they said, yeah, sure. And I'm like, I didn't set the plates down in the scene, though. I don't know if I can put the plate down, but they're like, it'll work. And I got the job. I got the job. <laughs> but this is the funny part, because I got in a fist fight during business hours with the water boy. And because this is the thing. Up until 40, I had never had anybody talk to me that wasn't, what can we get for you? You want a little mini Avion? It's like, yes, please. Right? So I don't have any life experience. I don't have relationships other than I made you money and you come to my parties. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's not deep. I have one good friend from grade school, you know, one good group, one from modeling. Like I have one from every decade. So it's not like I'm not without friends. I just have one good one that you don't have to see very often. So I'm the hostess. Okay. So it's two stories. So there's a party of eight and a party of 12 that's coming. And so I decide that the party of 12 goes in that corner and the party eight goes that corner. So the water boy, and he's like a, maybe I'd say 60, 70 year old Asian man, you know, barbacks, you know, he's been there for 50 years. When I come up, he goes, I come up with the party and he goes, you can't sit them there. You can't sit them there. And I'm like, whoa. And then, so those people are going like this, ur, 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 like trying to sit and half sit way stand up. Like, and this go, you can't sit them there. And I'm like, I got to sit them there. And then he's screaming in my face. And to me, I've never had somebody scream in my face in my life before. So I take my finger and I just go like this to his forehead. And then I straighten my arm and his head jerks back like that. And then he stands up like uh, in Karate Kid and he comes and he shoves me against the wall. And as soon as I'm against the wall, like my hands are up like a uh, fist, like not fist, like, you know, baby. So my hands are up and I hit the wall and all of a sudden screamers. Remember when the fight scene at the end of screamers, I come off that wall, like boom, boom. I do a kick. I sit whoop, and I sit down whoop, like, come on. And this when it goes in slow motion. Somebody who worked there in slow motion goes, get them apart like this and then so the 12 people get seated and the boss comes and says outside and I said oh, oh I gotta get a cigarette first you know <laughs> and then so I get a cigarette outside and she's like what was that and I was like he can't tell that I have 12 more people who are gonna go there and he's telling me what to do and he can't see and they're like oh, okay we'll get back inside and I'm like wait wait you gotta talk to him 
you can't just talk to me alone. I said, if you're not going to talk to him, then I'm not going to stay because he may do it again. And so they said, no, he's because it's New York. They're like, he's just having a bad day. Leave him alone. That's New York. Like, I'm glad like it wasn't a big scene. You know what I mean? Today it could have been like, wow, you know, <laughs> but I was a, you know, a trained actor to kill. <laughs> Switched into that screamers role. Yeah, I could like <laughs> click on like, you know, all of a sudden an experience. Uh, they're mostly fight experience, stage experience, fighting Freddy. Like you want to take a piece of me? I'm going to whack your head off. How long did you stick in that job for? Maybe a uh, week or two half and then i got another one i got another one and then um on page six in the new york post said something like the actress who used to do scenes with peter weller and so and so i remember they said his name and she's now serving people at this restaurant grace restaurant down in tribeca so all these school children Kind of in like, they look like school uniforms, actually. They kind of all look like they dress the same, you know. So I was getting like kid fans in front of the bar. What they would do is they would come in like single file and walk past me like ants and then go to the end of the bar, you know, and then there's a restaurant there kind of there, stand there for a few minutes. And then they would all like trail out like ants. <laughs> they were looking at me. And the boss there said, when I hired you, I didn't know you were famous. So I called the New York Post and I said, uh, you're going to get me fired saying bullshit like that because that guy didn't know. So they put me in the same week in the New York Post again, like Jennifer's the Statue of Liberty. We welcome you. I said, I'm trying to build up Tribeca after 9-11. Like, what is this bullshit? So they said something nice about me. And then I became a legend because only a couple of people have been in the New York Post twice in the same week. And then business was good. And I started dating that boss. I never dated a boss before. Right. I did all this lady to screenplays, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then I came back here to get my career back. But I was so beaten down by New York City that it was really going to be hard. Like I was bloated. My face still hadn't gone through the whole transformation process of aging to a settled place. So I started writing a script about the folklore of marijuana. And then I realized that marijuana is like a bad thing. So it was like not the easiest script to sell. I just wrote another one. And this one I never imagined playing, but then I, I'm, I'm going to play it. I'm going to play it myself because it's funny and I think there needs to be like this new voice where you just talk like how we're talking. There's not just a bunch of bullshit all over it. Is this for TV, film or stage? It's a stage play movie. So I want people to talk like this, like cartoons and stuff. But I want them to look like they're in a movie. But I don't want it to be like where theater looks like I'm talking to the back row. No, this is like fake stage entertainment. What's the time frame on that? Is there a time frame on it? Well, I can play that role anytime, but I just did the table read. From the table read, I just fin like if I want to go another 50 pages for hoots and whistles and healing, you know, because art heals, because I feel like there's more garbage that I didn't know that was in there. Kind of dealing with the trauma of having sensory disorders, you know, it's kind of like I feel like that little neglected monkey that now is like, oh, I understand something good. You know what I mean? Did you have a screenplay which Robert England and Lance Henriksen have shown an interest in? Oh, yeah, yeah. Him and Lance Hendrickson and William Forsythe. Ken Faree. That's not a bad lineup. No, I know. And I, I submit it to people who, so I'm on a website called Ink Tip where you submit your scripts and there's production companies that look for scripts. So when I see six companies are looking for it, I go there and I, I kind of mention these great people want to be a part of it because Robert read it because I write for older guys. Like I, you know, I, when I just saw Lance, I said, Lance, keep aging. The older you get, the better my film gets, as far as I'm concerned. And I can play my own role whenever I want. When it's in that nice, you know, like Strath Hamilton and Marcy, who made that first film where it was just nice. So Robert said, yeah, he goes, you know what you wrote? You wrote the folklore of marijuana. And I was like, yeah, I did. Because it was like, remember when it was such a boogeyman? Like it was so illegal, people in prison. So I want to do like, Robert, I want to play the priest on a marijuana farm who's having struggles with the Lord. <laughs> He'll eat that one up. <laughs> it 
it's so funny on so many levels. You know what I mean? It, the thing is, is like when you're watching this, I can because I can almost like like a dinner party, put them in a role and kind of unleash them like you would unleash a Chris Farley. If everybody knows their lines, we can all be Chris Farley. Awesome. You know what I mean? And the unexpected could happen as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then writing is, the writing is really solid because it's that long stage play dialogue. So you have to go so snappy. Like I had some great people in the audience. They're anonymous, but they are associated with Saturday Night Live and stuff. And he sat through the table read. Very nice man. Afterwards, he said, snappy dialogue. I was like, oh, yeah, it's going to snap. <laughs> Sweet. Jennifer, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but just hit kind of in closing. I love all the old Polaroids and memorabilia you share online at various points throughout your career. Are you a big collector of, let's say, memories in that way? Do you always have you always saved stuff throughout your career? No, because um, it's a terrible thing. I'm not materialistic. Even if I try to be, it'll get taken away. My things dissolve and I, I have a treasure chest of pictures that, you know, and I'm very sentimental about very, you know, somebody's handwriting on a piece of paper or, a you know, a little pencil, you know what I mean? So I'm like the jerk, you know, when he's, I just need this ping pong thing and I just need this and this coaster. So I have like just those things. And I, I started to think about sharing my life with people because I was so private before because of, I was hiding my sensory issue. So I shared those, but I only have so many. And They're wonderful, though. I love seeing that kind of stuff. I do, too. Well, I, sh- I got the, all the private ones, but I don't have much of my professional stuff. Like, I still am trying to get my headshots from the crush. It's a big palava, isn't it, business? Have you ever tracked down the magazine where you saw the Mohawk, which influenced Taron in Elm Street 3? Have you figured out what magazine that was in? Oh, I could because it was a, a, probably Newsweek or Time magazine. Right. That'd be cool to see that. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. Get on eBay. It's got to be on there somewhere. You just got to nail down the week, the month that it was. <laughs> The shooting date I was on set. I bet somebody has call sheets. Yeah, that'd be really cool to see that. This was the Mohawk that influenced it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the truth. There it is. Well, I love that we're still talking about that film. If I've got my math right, it's 35 years old this year. And uh, you've got the Dream Warriors reunion here in the UK later this year for the love of horror. Are you going to go? You better go. I'm hoping so. I think because I'm getting older, I don't like to be in like really crowded places. That is one busy convention. Is it? (laughs) Okay. It's one of the biggest of the year, but um, I certainly want to try and go. Yeah. So you're in for a treat. It's superbly well run and the guests they have there are just insane. So it's going to be a good one. You have a good time. I get one free guest. So if you want to be my free guest, I'll give you a ticket in. I might take you up on that people say that stuff and i'll perhaps hold you to it <laughs> yeah it's expensive i'm sure how long are you over here for when you come over is it just pretty much in and out I come a day early i sleep i eat all that good food i walk around i try to go to your pharmacies and get your makeup and and then i work and then uh, i go home thank you ever so much for chatting with me i've loved it appreciate all the stories you're an absolute star you're welcome and thank you so much and you know really touch base before we go there it's no problem oh that'd be wicked that'd be wicked to hook up lovely to speak to you so glad we got to hook this up all right take it easy Thanks so much to the brilliant Jennifer Rubin for coming along and talking to me on the Straight to Video podcast. Really cool of her and it was a lot of fun to hook up. Don't forget Jennifer will be over here in the UK this October at the For the Love of Horror convention in Manchester and tickets for the event can be found at fortheloveofhorroruk.com. As this podcast is currently releasing just one episode a week on Fridays, now is the perfect time to catch up on all other 190 episodes over at stvpod.com. And if you want to keep up to date on the new Straight to Video 80s video shop, then you can sign up to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash stvpod for all the behind the scenes access and photos. Or get on board over at 80s Video Shop on Twitter and Instagram with a Facebook page on the way once the shop is ready. All right, that is all for today's show. Thanks so much for the ongoing straight-to-video support, especially this past week. It's so great to have you on board, and I'm excited to where the future is going. So until we chat again, take care and speak soon. Speak soon.